everybody, welcome to episode 92 of the ASTAP show where we answer your Volkswagen and Audi questions. On this episode, we talk about OBD11 versus VAGCOM, IS38 turbos, and IS20 turbos. Alexander K via shopdap.com says, I currently am stage two with APR and I was thinking about going stage three with an IS38 turbo. Currently have an APR downpipe, R600 intake, racing line intake, hose, and turbo inlet. And I was wondering if you would recommend upgrading the pipes from the turbo to the intercooler and the intercooler to the throttle body before going stage three. Would rebuilding engine internals also be beneficial for reliability? If so, what parts? Okay, Alexander. You have a stage two GTI and you're looking to upgrade it. Uh, just wanna clarify something real quick before we go on to answer the questions. You mentioned going to stage three. Uh, different manufacturers use different verbiage for their stuff. Uh, APR stage three is not an IS38. It's actually a bigger turbo than an IS38. Uh, for example, Unitronic, we're a Unitronic dealer. They consider an IS38 upgrade on a GTI to be stage one or stage two plus, which uh, is the gap between stage two and stage three. Uh, stage three, if and when they come out with a stage three for Mark 7 GTI, I anticipate Unitronic will have a big turbo as opposed to the IS38, which is a turbo upgrade, but not a big turbo uh, by any means. So uh, just wanna clarify for anybody watching that they will make sure that everybody's on the same page when it comes to uh, turbo upgrades around Mark 7. Uh, in answering your question about, uh, let's touch on the pipes. I would say to me, investing the money in IS38 first would be my first advice because that's gonna be the best bang for your buck. And while I know it's probably maybe a little bit more of a reach and you might have to save a little bit more to get there first, I would suggest that because it's gonna give you a much better power output for the dollar. Uh, and so I would say not, not a necessity to upgrade them before. If you want to at a later time, then, then that's something that you consider. But I, I don't think it's one of those things that you do in preparation. I would say if it's a manual car, the clutch is probably more likely to be something that you want to think about because it is an expensive thing that if you drive the car real hard once you upgrade the turbo, you could potentially kill the clutch uh, much quicker. So, or you're almost certainly going to uh, because you know a lot of people have killed clutches on cars that don't have that much power. So when you get to IS38, I imagine most clutches aren't going to hold up under even average driving circumstances. Uh, in regards to upgrading internals, I would say absolutely not. Uh, upgrading internals is an extremely expensive endeavor and is not a necessity on these cars unless you're going to get much bigger into the power range. IS38 probably approaches the nearing of where you're probably close to the edge of that, but absolutely uh, would not do that unless you had uh, ambitions for really big power with a really big turbo and that type of stuff. So. Hopefully that answers your questions and happy modding. Chill via shopdap.com says, I just had the cylinder head replaces on a 2009 VW CC and I'm now getting a fuel trim code. Of course the mechanic I used wants to use some money out of me and he's saying it has to be the rear main seal if there are no vacuum leaks. He's saying since it's that, I might as well change the clutch too. I'm getting the fuel trim too lean and bank one sporadic code. Could it be something else? Math possibly? Okay. I think this is actually a really good question, uh, mostly because I think it touches on a, a fact of how people feel when their cars break and situations that arise and how a lot of times these situations can be pretty touchy. And, and uh, so I want to I dive into that a little bit. So you had your vehicle, had the valves bent, you know, obviously that's terrible. I, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, and then you got it fixed cylinder head replaced, you know, valves, whatever. I'm not sure exactly specifically what you had done, but let's just assume you had the cylinder head replaced. They swapped cylinder heads, uh, new timing stuff and, and everything. And now you're having a fuel trim issue. And the problem is a lot of times people get this sentiment that whenever you spent, let's say you spent three grand, uh, fixing a, that type of job. Let's say, uh, that's probably a reasonable amount of money to be spending three to $4,000. Um, you feel like when you spent three to four thousand dollars that the car should be right. The problem is that the, when the guy fixed the car, and and I want to preface this by saying I don't really know what's going on with the car. There's no way for me to know that. Um, is it possible that something he did is the reason why it has a vacuum leak? Possible. 
uh, based on what I'm, the feedback that you're kind of giving in, I'm kind of reading between the lines, it sounds like it's probably not the workmanship, it's probably not uh, intake manifold that's bad or uh, bad seal between the intake manifold and the cylinder head where it wasn't bolted down properly or uh, seal wasn't replaced or who knows. what. It doesn't seem like it's any of that. It seems like you brought it back to him to diagnose it, he was unable to find the vacuum leak, which is leaning him towards saying that it's probably a rear main seal, which I'd happen to agree with. If you've heavily diagnosed a, a leak or attempted to heavily diagnose a vacuum leak in a TSI engine and you cannot find the one anywhere, then it probably is coming from the rear main seal, which is terribly unfortunate given your situation. But unfortunately, I would say it's not the workmanship of the guy who is working on the car. Now, is it brutal that you just spent all this money and now you're now you're in this situation where you're potentially going to have to spend all this money again? Uh, absolutely, it's terrible. But unfortunately, that's not that guy's fault. And I know, oftentimes, being in this business, I've seen lots of people in these situations, and they blame the people who are working on their car, oftentimes because they just don't know. They just don't know. They feel like they've been taken advantage of because they have all, all these expenses mounting, and they just feel like they're being taken advantage of, and. While I agree sometimes that is the case, a lot of times it's not the case. Uh, and so in situations like this, it's always best to seek advice from somebody else if you feel like you're being taken advantage of. That's always my advice. If you go to somebody and you think they're taking advantage of you, go to somebody else. Uh, you know, worst case scenario, you're gonna find the answer and then now you have some ammunition to go back to the person who actually, if they legitimately are taking advantage of you. So. Um, in that circumstance, yes, could a mass airflow sensor cause lean situations? Yes. Is it, could it be his PCE valve? I hope that's been replaced first before this, but if it has been replaced, bad PCE valves can cause the rear mains to blow out. So that could be your situation there. So again, I can't diagnose your car. I can't know for sure one way or the other. Can other things cause vacuum leaks or, and or lean faults? A hundred percent. But that's why getting that second opinion from somebody uh, and again, this is not getting a second opinion because I'm not looking at your car, I'm not diagnosing it. Um, they actually have to follow a diagnostic process to know what's going on with the car. So hopefully that sheds some light on that subject for you uh, and gets you down the road of fixing that vacuum leak. Also real quickly, I would uh, recommend if you are going to have the transmission out of the car and it is a manual, I would highly recommend replacing the clutch because you're gonna spend six or $700 in labor to have somebody remove the transmission. So uh, that is an expense if you're planning on keeping the car long term that you would have to pay later on if you didn't now. So just be some, it's, it is something to consider. Uh, you know, everybody's situation is different, so maybe it isn't a choice for you, but uh, I would strongly advise considering it as an option. Dutch Boss via YouTube says, is OBD11 something I can use in my shop in place of VADCOM, or is it more of a tool for personal use? Okay, so OBD11 versus VADCOM. We are the US exclusive importer for OBD11. Um, but I, you know, obviously I wanna share for you whether it's good for us, bad for us. I wanna share for you, with everybody what the honest truth is about the, these tools and how they compare to each other and my opinion about it for professionals. Um, so first let's start off with individuals. I think for individuals, uh, there's a lot of ways that OBD11 is actually better for average people, especially when you talk about apps and coding and things that maybe people who don't know how to do coding at all now have the ability to do coding on their own. Um, it also still has access to all the other things and, and has a lower, lower barrier to entry as far as cost. Uh, let's move on to professionals. Uh, in terms of professionals, the, I would say as a purely diagnostic tool, if, you, if it's the only thing you're gonna use every single day to diagnose cars, I would say VADCOM is a better device. Uh, it, it's more sussed out, it's been around longer, uh, and, and because it's not relying on data, it doesn't have any connectivity or speed concerns around that, which that can happen sometimes with OBD11. Um, now, with that being said, we have tons of people who are technicians who buy them, either to keep in their toolbox or to keep in their pocket, or um, you know, shops who don't wanna buy five VADCOMs, but it's, it's much cheaper to buy a bunch of uh, OBD11s to have around. So, there are a lot of professionals who use them. I don't know, I would not consider it a replacement for VADCOM for, for a shop, 
but it is kind of a supplement. Uh, I know a lot of people, even uh, personal friends of ours who are customers who have both, but they ha they're able to take an OBD11, throw it in their glove box of their car and drive around because they have Android phones. And if they ever need it, it's always there as opposed to needing a laptop for, uh, you know, to use a VADCOM device. So you don't, most people don't want to leave a laptop in their car all the time. So um, good question. And I think that depending, if you're looking for it as a replacement, I would say it's probably not a replacement for a VADCOM for a professional who's using it every single day. Uh, but if you're looking for it as a supplement, then it, it could possibly be. And especially if you have, let's say, if you're at a shop, a small shop who specializes in Volkswagen Audi and maybe you have one or two VADCOMs and you just want to have another one or two so that when one is tied up, you you can still access code, scan them, all that stuff you need to do. Same stuff you would do with a VADCOM. So hopefully that answers your question and share some insight about that. Ed O'Brien via email says, I have a 2016 Mark 7 GTI with an APR Stage 2 tune. I currently have 39,000 miles in the odometer and I get a misfire in cylinder 3 when idling only. I was running the colder Denso IKH24 plugs and they were due for a change. So I figured that was the cause. I replaced the plugs and no change. Replaced the coil packs, no change. I'm thinking carbon or injectors. Am I on the right track? Alright, so it sounds like you followed the correct steps. You had a misfire in cylinder 3. You replace the spark plugs with a new one. Then you uh, replace the ignition coil. That obviously didn't solve your problem either. Now you're trying to figure out where you're at. Uh, yes, injector could be your problem. I would say that's probably the next most logical step. I very highly doubt you have carbon buildup for two reasons. One, you have low mileage. Two, you have a single cylinder misfire. Carbon buildup when it does happen and it still remains to be seen if it is going to be a Mark 7 problem. Uh, seems like the PCVs might be a little bit better on Mark 7s than the previous generations. But uh, carbon buildup, when it does happen, happens on all cylinders, sometimes on two because they're more likely to get carbon buildup, but generally on all of them. So for that reason, I would say it's very unlikely to be carbon buildup. So it's more likely to be an injector. And unfortunately, if it's not an injector, it's probably a mechanical problem in the engine, which is super bad news. So hopefully it is an injector and solves your problem. I'll put a link to the injector for that car here where you can check that out just in case you need one. Um, you could try swapping injectors from cylinder to cylinder. That would help you diagnose it. Just depends on your ability and how comfortable you are with the effort required to swap injectors. A lot of people would just replace the injector because the effort to remove the manifold, swap the injectors, then reinstall, then diagnose misfire, then uninstall and replace if, if it does move is generally not something that most people want to do and they just want to do the job one time. So um, again, hopefully that injector does solve your issue and good luck. Tough Bass via email says, I saw on shopdap.com that you guys offer a stage two tune for the 1.8T Mark 7 Golf that requires an IS-20 turbocharger. Does the IS-20 turbocharger for the Mark 7 GTI fit the 1.8T Golfs? If so, do I have to purchase an adapter so it can fit? Okay, so you have a 1.8T Golf and you're looking to upgrade to an IS-20. Uh, yes, Unitronic does have that stage two software. It doesn't require anything else. The IS-20 is just a direct swap in for a 1.8T to from, uh, and just for anybody who's not familiar, IS-20 is the GTI, Mark 7 GTI factory turbo that people can swap onto a 1.8T engine, which makes quite a bit of power and gives you a pretty significant bump. Uh, you know, obviously good news about IS-20 is because a lot of people upgrade, you know, like our previous question, a lot of people with GTIs upgrade to IS-38. The used market is obviously really strong for those. I'll link to a new IS-20 if that's what you're looking for, where you, where you can check that out here. But again, the used market for IS-20s is really solid because the fact that a lot of those people who have those from the factory are upgrading to IS-38s so you can get them used. Uh, the one obviously caveat to any used turbo is if the person drove like a maniac everywhere they drove, uh, there's a decent possibility it's been abused and may not be the choice for you. So that really is a matter of preference, but maybe you can buy one cheap enough that you're, that it's not a big deal. And the labor of doing it, if you're doing it yourself, doesn't scare you as far as the cost being prohibitive. That's the one thing that I think a lot of people maybe don't recognize is if you're buying a used part, um, and it fails you have to pay for labor again if you're paying for labor the first time. So now you're now you have a pretty significant cost. Whereas a new part could fail, but it's really unlikely. 
um, and uh, obviously a used one's much more likely to fail. So, but yes, IS20s are great. Direct swap in, super easy. All you need to do is install the turbo, put the software on, uh, and the uh, accommodating hardware, but no adapters or anything are required. So uh, hopefully I answered your question and hopefully you can enjoy an IS20 on your 1.8T. Thank you so much for watching episode 92 of the Ask Dap Show, where we answer your Volkswagen and Audi questions. If you have any questions or comments about the questions answered in this show, be sure to leave in the comments below. If you like this video, be sure to give a thumbs up and subscribe for more like it.